So uh, when you are using the TID-9 to uh, solve a system of equations, now also you can usually solve them by hand as well, but if you have access to the TID-9, uh, you might as well uh, use it. Hey, remember, it's, uh, the system solving template is located under the custom tabs. Okay, so when you look up here, these are not the custom tabs. This is just your general set of tabs. So if you hit second home to access this custom, you'll now see that F3 is the solve tab. So you'll use that solve tab and the fourth line is the template. If you just click on it, I do make sure that your cursor is this insert cursor, right? I think I talked about second backspace uh, toggles back and forth between the insert and overwrite cursors. So the big block is the overwrite and then the, the uh, just the line is the insert. And so you can put that in between. So if you uh, adjust this, move it after the parentheses and solve, type in your first equation. So 2x plus 3y, the equal sign is right below the x, uh, equals 2. Scroll over uh, after the and and the space. Now, assume that, let's say you accidentally deleted the space. If you need to add that space back, the space is located right here uh, where the change of sign key is. See how the white underscore button. So if you hit alpha and then this uh, change of sign, it gives you a space. And then you can write your second uh, equation, x minus 2y equals 8. And once you do that, everything should be set up for you. And you get your answer. So the, the system would be 4, negative 2, depending on what was being asked for that problem. All right, so that's, again, just a reminder of how you can use the system solving template uh, for a system of equations. All right, so this is kind of where we left off here. Uh, I have the video captures are posted, so if you weren't here uh, yesterday, you can look at the Tuesday um, notes, and it'll lead you right up to this point. And so we finished talking about the Algebra 1, the main Algebra 1 content that tends to be covered on the SAT, and we started uh, going through the Algebra 2 material. Okay, and so um, this is the second concept from the Algebra 2 that is emphasized on the SAT, and that is taking some kind of equation or formula from science or math and uh, solving it for a given variable. And so see if you can solve uh, this equation here um, and choose which of the uh, versions A through D is the correct answer. First step, always scan your answer choices without even having to read any of the question. Uh, you can see that you're going to solve the equation for K. And part of the reason why I suggest you scan the answer choices is oftentimes you, you can understand what's being asked uh, just by looking at what they're asking you to choose from. Uh, and so you don't have to read any of this text. I mean, if you're interested, you can go in and see what each of those variables means. But when it comes uh, to trying to save time uh, and answer quickly, uh, just by looking at the answer choices, you know you're going to solve for K. The other thing that you kind of notice here is that you don't have to distribute everything out. And the answer, every answer choice has parentheses, has grouping symbols. And so when you look at this problem, understand that you're going to have grouping symbols. It, you don't want to work with fractions. And so if, you, if your first thought was to distribute the 9 fifths, and then try to solve for k, it's going to complicate things. And what we want to do is we want to isolate the k in the simplest way possible. So the first step would be to undo the order of operations in the reverse order. So undo adding and subtracting first. I'm going to subtract 32 from both sides. Now notice, if I distribute the 9 fifths, I'm working with fractions and I'm going to have to do some calculations. SAT is designed in a way that you really don't need to be doing calculations, especially on the no calculator part. And so what we can do is we can now get rid of that fraction by multiplying by the reciprocal. And okay, so instead of uh, distributing the 9 fifths, what I want to do is take both sides, multiply by the reciprocal, 5 ninths. So these cancel and these cancel. And now notice... We have our grouping symbols, the F minus 32, and, and we just leave it. Again, don't need to distribute it through. The last step to isolate the K here is to add 273 to both sides. 
so plus 273, that's equal to your K value, and you have your answer. Look for where is this uh, on our choices here, and you see it's option D. Okay. So the answer choices uh, can give you a hint into what you're being asked to solve for. We skip to uh, page 12 here and look at the next content area uh, again, which is just operations with polynomials, and that involves adding and subtracting. It involves multiplying as well. And so I want you to, uh, and it involves factoring and expanding. So those expanding is part of multiplying, but those are sort of the three main things that you're going to see. Okay, so try uh, question seven here. See if you can identify uh, what is the correct answer. Once again, when you scan the answer choices, you see something that isn't always going to be the case. You see that uh, normally you'll either see uh, that something's written in the fully expanded form, like standard form, like the uh, A and B options, or you'll see that all the options are written in factored form, like C and D. This one has both. What that means is, that, I mean, winds up meaning there's a couple different ways to work through and solve this. Um, Usually, if you see factors, you'll expand it to solve, and if you see a polynomial, you'll factor to solve. Okay? But here, again, more than likely, all of you did the same thing, which is you expanded these and then combined like terms, which is fine, and, and that's kind of one of the ways to do it. The main thing, if you are going to expand this, is to understand that 2x minus 2, a binomial square, has a middle term. Okay? It's not just 4x squared plus 4. You have to have that middle term there. So if we do expand this, we get first term squared. We take the product of the terms and double it. So 2x times a negative 2 is negative 4x. Double that, you get negative 8x. Square the last term, negative 2 squared is a plus 4. Then distribute your negative. I'm going to vertically stack this under the like term. So minus a 2x and uh, minus a minus gives me plus 2. So here. Um, when you are uh, looking at this, you get a 4x squared minus 10x plus 6. So when I look here, neither of these expanded forms is correct. And so what you would then have to do is go through and now factor this. And really, uh, you know that one of these two options is correct. So rather than factoring this polynomial, you can just expand each of these. And so when I look at my last terms, my last terms, I either get a positive 4 or a positive 6. I know I need a positive 6. So I don't even need to expand the full thing. I just need to find something that distinguishes. All right, so that's the process I assume most of you or, and most students will go through. What I do, I want to show you another method that you can use for this if you recognize it, and it's a little bit faster, more efficient. And because uh, normally if you see a problem like this and it's written as these factors, you normally, it tells you you're going to expand it to solve the problem. Okay, but because you have uh, two answer choices written as factors, it may kind of mean that, okay, there's something up. This isn't like sort of the usual pattern. And so can you solve this by factoring? Well, if I look at these two binomials, we have the shared binomials, right? 2x minus 2. So I could actually take that out as a common factor between these two groups. And if I do, if I take out uh, 2x minus 2 from this, I'm left with 1 2x minus 2. And if I take out a 2x minus 2 from the second group, I'm left with just a 1, right? I have, a, I have to have a placeholder there when I remove it. And so if I think of this and factor it out, what I can then do is combine the terms inside my second factor, negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. And if I do it that way, it actually leads right to and directly to the uh, correct answer. Okay. Now again, this is just something that if you see it, you can do it. More than likely, uh, you'll expand it and then factor or compare uh, the expanded form to the uh, options C and D. All right, I do want you to try uh, question eight here as well. Uh, again, this is kind of a, a typical type of problem that you're expected to do without using a calculator. Okay, but see if you can answer this question. Uh, again, I, I want to talk through 
the strategy for solving it um, is consistent with what you will likely see on your SAT. So these are two polynomials here, and you're combining them, so you're subtracting them. When you scan your answer choices, what you see is your leading coefficients either going to be a negative number or a positive number, and your constants either going to be a one-third or a three-halves. By looking at that, it makes it uh, easier for you to kind of figure out what you need to do to solve for this. Okay, and so when you look at, uh, let's say, the, the constants first are probably the easier thing. You have a plus one minus a minus gives you plus one half. So one plus one half is three halves. So that means you can eliminate options A and B. Uh, eliminating answer choices is a very successful strategy uh, for solving the SAT. Because again, you're not penalized for wrong answers anymore. You used to be, but now you're not. So uh, reducing the, the number of possible choices to choose from, even if you don't, uh, answer, or if, even if you don't know how to solve it, you can reduce it down and, and just have a better chance of guessing correctly. So now all you have to do is to, to determine is your leading coefficient going to be a positive number or a negative number. I have 1 8, <coughs> 188, <coughs> sorry, 188 minus 144. Well, 144 is actually 2 over 88, right, if we put it in terms of the same denominator. So 1 minus 2 gives you a negative. And so you know your leading coefficient is negative. Again, you can get your correct answer without actually solving the problem just by using uh, sort of patterns in the process of elimination. All right. The uh, next uh, problem has to do with um, nonlinear graphs. And especially quadratic functions, there's three different forms that you're going to see quadratics. You'll see them as standard, vertex, and intercept form. So remember, the standard form looks like ax squared plus bx plus c. Vertex form is a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k. And the intercept form is A times the factors uh, X minus P and X minus Q. <clears throat> okay, for each of these forms, what you are, and you are expected to know each of them, any, th any of the three forms could be used. And you need to know how the vertex uh, uh, can be found for each of these forms. So actually, before I do this, I'm going to write these in function notation because I'm going to refer to the function. So I'm just replacing a y with the f of x notation. Because when we find our vertex here, the vertex for a standard form can be found by taking negative b over 2a, right? That gives you your x coordinate. And then you take whatever that value is and you substitute it into your function and evaluate. So if we find f of negative b over 2a, that's going to be our y coordinate. The vertex, the vertex form is easy to find, right? The vertex is just hk. That's the whole point of writing it in that form. And then finally, the vertex in uh, intercept form is going to be the average of the x coordinates. So the two x or the x intercepts, the two x intercepts are p and q. So if we take the average of those, and then we evaluate that number back into the function to get the corresponding y value. All right, and so what this means or uh, what you can do for this is that when you look at this function in this problem, and I'll give you a second to solve it, but I'm going to kind of uh, give you a hint as to how you go about it. But if you're given this function, what you see is it's in intercept form. And so you know the two x-intercepts. And it's the two values of x that give you zeros for each function, right? So x is equal to 2 and x is equal to negative 4. Those are your two x-intercepts. And so based on that information, I want you to see, can you find your, your vertex CD okay, and then identify, well, what is the y-coordinate of that vertex? So see if you can kind of follow that, um, come up with your answer, and then I'll talk through. I mean, I kind of set this up visually. So first thing I do is I scan my answer choices, and I see that all my answer choices have a variable in them. 
And so that means you're probably not going to plug those directly in, although you can assign values to A and then test them in to the equation. Um, but when I look at this uh, problem, I go back to the equation, I see that it's in intercept form. I also notice that my two x-intercepts for this graph are going to be negative 4 and positive 2. And the whole point of a parabola, and I'm going to assume here that A is a positive number just so I can sketch my graph. So if I look at my graph, is going to be here. Okay, this is my vertex. The vertex is always halfway between the two x-intercepts. That's what this relationship up here is saying. So I know that right through this point right here is going to be my vertex. And I know that this is the average of those. So negative 4 plus 2 over 2, that's the x-coordinate which gives me negative 2 over 2, which gives me negative 1. So I know that my C value here is negative 1. The question is asking me to find the Y coordinate, the D value. Well, in order to do this, what I then need to do is evaluate my function for that X coordinate, which I saw or calculated was negative 1. So if I take negative 1 now and plug that back in here, so I'm going to take F of negative 1, I get A times negative 1 minus 2 times negative 1 plus 4, right? I just plugged in the negative 1 in those placeholders for X. And now when I solve it, that's going to be my answer, D. So if I evaluate this, I have my A out front, negative 3, positive 3. So that gives me a negative 9A. And so that will be my answer choice. That's the uh, Y coordinate for my vertex. Okay, so you can think of it visually. but um, or you can understand how the vertex is determined uh, based on which form of a um, quadratic function. The two most popular, or the two most common nonlinear graphs that you're going to uh, be working with uh, will be quadratic functions, the parabola, and then exponential functions. And so those would be like you're likely going to see those. All right. The next question, again, is one that. Um, not really within the last year, these, these problems haven't really shown up, but before that, these were super common problems. And again, they're on their last, I mean, they're on their last four or five versions of this test. So my guess is they're not creating many new problems. They're using, gonna use a lot of their old problems to finish up. I, um, but I want you to see how you would answer this, and then I'll talk through sort of the strategy of it. Uh, but I want you to, um, see what can you do or what can you answer before I talk through this. When you scan your answer choices, you see that you're dealing with uh, graphs. And so you need to read the question to find out what is it that they're asking you to identify for these graphs. Well, here you want four distinct zeros. Remember, uh, zeros of a function correspond to x-intercepts. So what this says is we want to look for the graph and find which one intercepts the x-axis at four different points. Well, here's one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four. So there's your answer, one, two. Okay, and so it's just a matter of identifying uh, the zeros are x-intercepts. Now, the other version, and, and I think we'll see it here uh, in one of the practice problems that I go over with you, uh, the other version of this same question would be uh, something to the effect of if it says uh, if P of X equals 3 has two solutions, what would, which of the graphs would it be? And so if that's the case, what you would do is you'd look at 1, 2, and 3, and you would draw your own line to see here's three intercepts that have that same Y value. So uh, that would be the other way that you might see it in and. Again, it's likely in another question that we'll come across here uh, soon. All right, let's jump back to the odd, odd questions again. If this is considered a challenging question. So this was uh, the second, second to last or third to last question in a section. And so I want you to give it your best shot, but know uh, uh, if you don't get it, and you, um, that's fine. But give it, a, give it your best shot. All right, one of the things that you need to know about nonlinear graphs is uh, both how factors correspond to intercepts, what the general tendencies are, 
like so up and to the right, down and to the right, uh, and so on, uh, based on the sign of the leading coefficient and the degree of the polynomial. And then the other thing would be multiplicities. Okay? So uh, know that if you have a, a factor with a power of 1, the graph just passes straight through the x-intercept. If the factor has a power of 2, it bounces off, right, and, and uh, bounces off of that x-intercept. And if the graph or if the factor has a power of three, it snakes through, right? So it's either straight line through, bounce off, or snake through. So when you're looking at this, what we can do is we can sketch what the tendencies of this graph tell us. So looking at this graph, we have three intercepts, right? We have an intercept at one, at negative one, and at negative two. So I'm going to just plot those. Okay, so here's negative 2, negative 1, and 1. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing I know. The next thing I know is that my leading coefficient is a 1. Okay, and so the total degree of this factor, or of this function, there's a power of 1, 1, and 1. So my total degree is 3. So this is an odd powered function, or an odd degree. And an odd degree with a positive leading coefficient goes up and to the right, down and to the left. You guys remember that tendency? Okay. Now, if, there, if the graph uh, had an x plus 2 squared, then this graph would bounce off here. But it doesn't. It has an x plus 2 uh, to the first. So that means that this graph is going to pass straight through. So when we look at tendencies, this graph is going to pass through the x-axis. And then at some point between the negative 2 and the negative 1, it has to curve back down and pass through negative 1, right? Well, at negative 1 has, uh, at this factor, where the 0 is a negative 1, it also has a power or a multiplicity of 1. So once again, it's just going to pass straight through. It's not going to bounce off of that. If it had been an x plus 1 squared, then it would bounce off of that intercept. And it passes through, and then again, somewhere down here between negative 1 and 1, it needs to change directions. And again, at the 1, this factor, x minus 1, has a multiplicity of 1. So once again, it's going to pass straight through. So even though we don't know how high those green marks go, okay, we know that they have that general tendency. Okay, and that's enough to, for you to answer these questions because what you're being asked to evaluate here is look at this interval. So we're looking at the interval from, oops, sorry. We're looking at this interval from negative 1 to 1. Right? This is the part of the graph that we're focused on. And it's inclusive. It includes the, the critical points here. So it includes these actual points. All right, so now what we're being asked to do is uh, find which of these is not a possible value of B. Well, B is our Y intercept. So look at, let's look at our Ys. Right, if we look, what is the total range for our Ys here? So the lowest possible Y we can have is some negative number. So some negative number down here. Again, we don't know how low it goes, but we know it's some negative number. And the highest possible value of y we have is 0. Right? So our dom or the range for this portion of the function is from 0 down to some negative number. Well, what that means is that uh, no positive number can work. Right? There's the negative numbers can work, so I'll eliminate that because we're looking for the exceptions. The 0 can work. That's the highest possible y value. But we can't go any higher than 0, right? You can't get it. None of those, uh, none of the portion of that graph goes into the positive y's. And so that's your one, uh, the one solution that will not work. Right? So again, that is definitely a, a tricky and hard question. But it, uh, it does emphasize some of the tendencies that you need to know uh, going into the test. All right, let's jump to uh, the next page here, 14, get back to or the next odd question here. Okay, so the next uh, concept uh, that you will likely see are equations that are uh, nonlinear, non-quadratic equations. And the next most common one is going to be radical or rational equations, so either fractions or radicals. So I want you to try this uh, question 13 here first. This type of question is one that um, 
is definitely gives you a reason why um, the taking a course on SAT prep or learning some strategies for this will give you a little bit of extra time because uh, when you solve this equation, um, what's very likely is um, all of your, so you scan the answer choices, you see wh what your possibilities are. You could plug them in, right, and I'll come back and talk about that because that's the ideal strategy. But most students are going to look at that. It's very familiar to them. Uh, when you solve a, an equation with a radical, you isolate the radical, you square it to get rid of the radical, you combine your like terms, and you solve the resulting equation. Did anybody do that process? Okay, so that's just that's what we are conditioned to do uh, like as students. Okay, however, the one thing with a radical equation is the final step of solving a radical equation, if your teachers write out the, the steps, should be check your solution. Right? So even if you go through all of that work, whatever you do, you're going to have to plug it back in and solve it and check your answers. Well, you know one of these four options is the answer. So by going through all that work, that's one of those cases where you're wasting the time that you could be spending on other questions. Okay? So if you recognize right here, we know that one of these is our answer choice. We're going to have to check our solutions anyway. And so what we can do is we can just pick one of these values and, and test it in, plug it and test it in. Okay, so let's say we start with uh, negative 1. Okay, so uh, here if we take, um, here if 1, or if A is equal to 1. So if we have X plus 1 equal to X minus 5. So if we look at that equation, So if we look at that equation and test in a negative 1 for x, we get negative 1, that's a 0, is 0 equal to 0 minus 5? No. Plug in the 3. Is 3 plus 1 is the square root of 4 equal to 3 minus 5, negative 2? No. So we can eliminate 3s. So what you see is that only leaves 1. And so you're going to have to do that anyway. But if it's, it's, if it's in your, your head that that's the very first strategy to test, it'll save you all of the time that it took to expand this out, to combine your terms, and then to refactor everything. Okay, so uh, look to plug in answer choices anytime you can, anytime that you're not working with fractions or difficult numbers to manage. All right, because um, the other type of equation that is somewhat common are rational equations. I want to go through one of those as well. So uh, try the very next problem, 14, as well, please. Again, this is one that is considered a more challenging question. It's toward the end of a section. Okay, the first way is, is probably, again, what m more students would probably lean toward, and that is uh, if you look at your answer choices, and one of the strategies, and I'll come back and talk about this second, but one of the strategies is anytime you have variables in your answer choices, you can assign numbers to each of those variables and you can test what the, those numbers would be in the original form versus the uh, answer choice form. Okay, and I'll come back and that's the second strategy, although that's what I would use first, I think is a more efficient strategy. But the one that most students would likely see is when you look at your answer choices, you see that you have um, some forms, but these B and C, uh, if you can just uh, look at A over B, if you can take this equation that's given and solve for A over B, uh, you can at least uh, eliminate two of the answer choices if one of them doesn't work. So if I cross multiply right here, I get 3B is equal to 7 times A minus B, distribute the 7. And then since I want to get the form A over B, I need the A and B on opposite sides here. So I'm going to add 7B. And now I want the form A over B, so I'm going to divide both sides by B, and then divide both sides by 7. That gives me my A over B here is 10 over 7, and I see that that happens to be my answer choice C. So uh, I was working to either solve one of them or eliminate two. I was able, and so in this I, I was able to solve it. Now if I didn't get the right answer from those two, then I would look to try to find the form A plus B over B, or the form A minus 2B over B. And so that's, the, that's sort of the mathematical strategy of doing this. The SAT-specific strategy uh, for this would be, since you see that all your answer choices are variables, what you could do is you could just plug in values for A and B. 
Well, if you do this, it's probably easiest to pick for what B is. If we know that A minus B over B is equal to 3 over 7, what can we assign to B? Nice, easy number. If we let B equal 7, right, and then what would A have to be if A minus 7 is equal to 3? A would be 10, right? So one thing that you could do is you could just let those be, and if you then plug them into your answer choices to see which ones work and don't, here I have uh, 10 plus 7 over 7. Is that equal to 10 sevenths? No. Uh, I have 10 over 7. Does that equal negative 4 over 7? No. 10 over 7. Does that equal 10 over 7? Yes. Now, if you do this strategy... Uh, you have to test every possibility because there are cases where multiple uh, options will work. If they do, you just would need to pick a different set of numbers uh, for the second time through. But if I test this last one, 10 minus 2 times 7 all over 7, does that equal negative 11 over 7? No. And so by process of elimination, you could also solve for C.